The point of this tale is to drive home a nail. You'll be getting a booklet like this. 1948, and national insurance has expanded rapidly, covering more workers should they fall on hard times and for when they retire. <laughs> you lucky people! But it's an outdated, overcomplicated system, the Prime Minister told voters in Rotherham today, and his plan isn't just to lower it by two pence, as in yesterday's budget, but eventually scrap it altogether. Everyone in work is paying tax twice, once in income tax, once in national insurance. That's unnecessarily complicated because all that money ultimately goes into the same pot to fund the same public services. Everyone must have a contribution card and a national insurance number. Not everyone would be affected equally, though. NI is only paid on earned income. And there is an electorally important portion of society who aren't keen on this or much else in yesterday's budget. I think it would have been nice if the Chancellor had made some mention of pensioners. So all in, was this a good budget for pensioners? Well, it depends what happens to income tax and all the other taxes when national insurance is abolished. If, uh, and I hope it's if rather than when, to be honest, uh, national insurance were just scrapped uh, and income tax was increased, to offset that for working age people, pensioners would lose out significantly because their tax rates might well rise. For the opposition, desperate to convince the nation they are now the party of fiscal responsibility, this is a gift. The Chancellor made a staggering £46 billion unfunded commitment to abolish national insurance. That's bigger than Liz Truss's commitment, so they've learned absolutely nothing. You can get the address of your national insurance place from the post office. Rishi Sunak says it's his ambition long term. The problem is time in power may only be short. Well, earlier I spoke to Conservative Member of Parliament Stephen Hammond. I began by asking whether he thinks moving from cutting national insurance to talk of getting rid of it altogether means that the Prime Minister realises his budget didn't much move the dial. Well, I think that if we'd gone out with a big bribe or a big rabbit, the public would have laughed and said it's just a pre-election budget and you're not treating us seriously. What I say is I think this is important... But it is a pre-election budget, isn't it? Well, who knows? With the, the budget... Uh, may well, they may well be another uh, financial event sometime in the autumn. The, uh, the Chancellor and the Prime Minister have both said the uh, election is likely to be in the autumn. So there's some time for this to bed itself in. There's some time for the economy to continue to pick up. And what the Prime Minister said today was probably thinking about various things that may or may not be in the manifesto. The one group of voters that Tories have traditionally been able to rely on are the elderly, pensioners. They're not getting a great deal out of this budget, are they? Because uh, reducing national insurance doesn't really affect them because they're not in work. Because of the fiscal drag, they end up paying more taxes. Well, uh, have you abandoned your traditional heartland of voters, then? No, I mean, you're right. They don't get anything out of the NI because it's being concentrated on people of working age. But you are, of course, remembering that they are about to get an 8.5% increase in state pension in the next month, which is significantly ahead of what the current inflation level is. And far from abandoning them, keeping the triple lock has looked after pensioners over the last few years. Finally, I mean, it was billed as a pre-election budget. It may or may not be. Who knows? But it's not very bold. And I just wonder whether the reason for that is that you're still having to deal with the long shadow of Liz Truss's government. We're having to deal with the long shadow of a number of things, uh, particularly the overhang still of the COVID and the impact that's had on debt levels, the shock to supply side, and that's what that's had on inflation in the impact. And so there are a number of uh, headwinds on the economy. Yeah. But this government has put in place reducing inflation, which is happening, which is key, and then supporting people who are in work to make sure that work pays and rewarding business. Right. But, but the reason why inflation uh, is coming down is because of energy prices. They're set by the global market. The reason why interest rates will come down is because of the Bank of England. And the reason why there is some growth is because of immigration, which is something that the Tories don't like very much. None of these things have anything to do with government policy. Well, you can't have it both ways, can you? You can't say that it was always the government's fault on inflation went up. Uh, and that uh, you know, the, there was no growth, if I was saying that some of that is happening. The government has done other things that have worked as well in terms of making sure inflation is falling. And in terms of growth, it's a, it's a mixture of things, and certainly there has been some help from immigration, mm. but there's also been help from increasing business investment and growth in the economy for people recovering from the shocks of COVID. 
Stephen Hammond, got to leave it there. Thanks very much indeed. Thank you.